and uh, hopefully we can uh, learn a little bit about this. I think I went over the ATC set, the 2015 SBT guidelines, uh, trying to uh, get whatever is more important for you guys to understand, um, both from a diagnostic perspective as well as a management, and see how that would uh, help you guys well in words and when you pull a console, uh, sort of have a good idea of what you're guys are calling for. So the definition of SVTs, SVT is basically an umbrella term uh, that is used to describe tachycardias, uh, which involve tissue from the this bundle or above for its maintenance. So you can see here the bundle of this um, right before the two uh, brand, uh, bundles separate. Um, and so anything that happens above that and uses part of that tissue to perpetuate itself, and we'll talk about that in a minute, uh, is called an SVT. Uh, we will not be talking about FIP or flutter um, because, well, actually, the 2015 guidelines don't include FIP as an SVT, um, even though they are, and flutter as well. But the thing is that that's a way more extensive top topic, and they are management is somewhat different, especially because from an anti pollution perspective, which we don't need to do that for any of the other ones we'll be talking about today. So, um, the three most common ones, and actually the three that they mentioned in, uh, in ATC SAP are AV and RT. ADRT, ATAC, and then we also have inappropriate sinus tachycardia there. Um, so AVNRT happens in 60% of the cases, almost ADRT 30%, although it's the most common one in pediatric patients. And then ATAC is, uh, happens 10% of the time. Uh, ATAC can be separated as well. You have um, unifocal atrial tachycardia, and then you have a type of ATAC that's called sinus node free anti tachycardia. Um, that we'll talk about that in a minute, and um, and then MAT, which um, is also a type of ATAC. Um, so if we want to talk about a way to sort of uh, separate or um, try to go on an algorithm as to how to diagnose an SVT, obviously the first thing we need to know is the QRS uh, duration, so less than 120 milliseconds is uh, what we need. Um, the, first, the next question would be, is it regular or irregular? If it's irregular, uh, we think about AFib, we think about ATAC or flutter with variable conduction and MAT. Um, if it's irregular, um, next question would be, do we see any P waves? If we don't see any P waves, um, then likely we're seeing AV and RT just because a lot of times the P wave hides inside the QRS. Um, well, sometimes we can see it right after the QRS or even right before, but then it's a uh, one way to separate it. If, you, if we do see P, wave, P waves, the next question would be, um, is the atrial rate greater than ventricular rate? So flutter and atrial tachycardia can manifest themselves as we have all heard about like two to one flutter, three to one flutter. So you have two atrial beats or three atrial beats, four atrial beats, five atrial beats for every ventricular beat. And ATAC can actually be the same way. You can have two to one ATAC. Um, and I'll show you an EKG with that. Um, if we, if the atrial rate is the same as the, as the, as the ventricular rate, and there's another separation there, and I think this is getting a little bit too uh, specific there, but whenever a broad way to separate SVTs is in, depending on the RP. If they, you, you talk about RP, short RP and long RP. Short RP means that the RP, so from the beginning of the QRS to the beginning of the P wave, is shorter than the beginning of the P wave to the next QRS. And that will basically tell us a little bit about the mechanism. And um, if it's a very short RP, so the so the P wave happens right after the P, the QRS, and it's very, very, uh, it's a very, very short interval. It can actually be diagnostic for AV and RT. But again, we're not going to see that unless we do an EP study. So I don't know if it's really important for us to go into that. So clinically, um, the symptoms are very nonspecific. Uh, I feel a lot of things we see that in cardiology in general, but palpitations, lightheadedness, chest pain, dyspnea, and syncope. And even though syncope is a lot of times a reason they call us for SVTs, it's important to know that people actually don't pass out from SVT in general. Um, it's not as common as we think. Uh, it can happen in elderly patients just because obviously they're older and they might not take the lower cardiac output that might be happening for them. But really, what the reason that most people with uh, SVTs pass out is uh, because they have sort of like a tachycardia syndrome. And what happens in those cases, you can see here in the CPD that I'm showing you guys up here, um, you see somebody who was in AFib, and then suddenly it breaks. 
and then they go into a sinus pause or a rest, and then they have like a junctional escape. So it's in that setting where they have that pause, uh, where they can actually pass out. And that's more diagnostic of actually what we call sick sinus syndrome or tachypnea syndrome. Um, and that's, that's actually when people pass out, not from the SVP in general. So that's really what we're looking for whenever we get a consult for SVT and they say, oh, somebody passes out, like that's really what we're looking for. Not so much, obviously if it's a rate of 200, 220, 230, that's less likely to be tolerated, but this is really the point where people, most, people, most patients pass out. And the things that we see on the physical exam, um, and on A waves, basically it happens when the atria contracts against a closed uh, tricuspid valve. Um, and we basically see the, that's really what the patients feel like this fluttering on their neck. It's uh, the, the atrial contracting against a closed tricuspid right, valve and it just causes sort of a regurgitation of all the blood into the um, SVT and then into the jugular. Um, and then the louder is one, I mean, it's, it, I would want to be honest, this is actually very hard to know, but because they're going so fast usually, but just remember that whenever somebody goes into, when somebody's tachycardic, they don't, systole and diastole, or the, or the two components, but the CCL is never really affected in tachycardia. The only duration that gets shortened is diastole. So if you think about it, when you're going really, really fast and diastole gets shortened, the mitral valve is still still returning to be closed. Um, it's still not fully closed before uh, ventricular CCL happens. So then sort of that, um, the closure of the valve is gonna be a little more aggressive, for example. And that's why we're gonna, uh, here, the outer is one. Um, so that's really what we, the only things that we can see clinically in these patients. Um, when we talk about the EKG, I thought the most important thing, and I feel a lot of times we've been consulted for this, and I think this would be very important for you guys to uh, try to get a sense of what we're looking for. But obviously, if we're talking about SVT, we know it's a narrow complex. And that's fine. The cure rate is less than 120, and we're all good. But it, obviously, we, there's cases that we can have an SVT with a variancy, and we can see what looks like an like a VT, but it's actually SVT with a variancy. So the differential diagnosis is ventricular tachycardia, SVT with a pre-existing bundle, or an IVCD, um, SVT with a variant conduction, which is basically like what we call like a functional uh, bundle. So you, when you're in sinus rhythm or normal rate. You have a normal conduction and you have a narrow QRS. But once you go faster, you actually create a bundle. And what we, we can sometimes see that. Uh, we can see SVT in the setting of hyperkalemia, for instance, and you have a white QRS, and it looks like VT. And then we have, we can have SVT over an accessory pathway, which we see in like well, Parkinson's white syndrome. And uh, that can actually also look like VT, but it's still an SVT. Uh, pace rhythms, and we'll. I'll show you an EKG about with that and then artifacts that we see in our plot. So again, there's multiple criteria that we can see differentiate VT and SVT. Uh, we can see AV dissociation, uh, what we call concordance. Uh, we can compare the QRS from the baseline EKG to the tachycardic EKG. And if the QRS has looked the same, the morphology looks the same, the axis looks the same, then it's more likely to be SVT. Um, and then the R wave. Um, in uh, ABR. So, again, these are the things that we see. So, this is AB dissociation. AB dissociation is basically uh, the opposite of complete heart block. So, complete heart block basically means that your atria are disconnected from your ventricle and your atria are going faster than the ventricle. So AB dissociation means that your atria and your ventricles are not communicating with each other, but the ventricles are going faster than the atria. Right? So, here we see the ventricles are going at a rate of, I don't know, two. 70 or so, it's going really fast. And then, uh, and we see P waves here. And again, I, I agree that it's really, really hard to see sometimes on the EKG, but this is what we're looking for. So this is a P wave, this is a P wave, this is a P wave. So again, we see that the rate, the, the atrial rate is actually much lower. It's in the 100 range, while the ventricular rate is much faster. So that basically, that is called AB dissociation. And the ventricular rate goes much faster than the atrial rate, and there's no communication between the two chambers. Um, with that being said, uh, I'm going to skip this one for a minute and uh, talk about this one here. Um, so this is obviously somebody who's in VT, and then suddenly we can see something that looks sort of like uh, 
uh, sinus beats. So this is these are basically called capture beats, and these are called fusion beats. And uh, these are actually also diagnostic for VT. And what happens here is that you have somebody who's going on VT consistently, and then suddenly a P wave and a QRS happen exactly at the same time. So this is what this is what's called a fusion beat, and basically means that this is a, sort of like an intermediate between the ventricular beats and the sinus beat. You see the Q, the QRS is not really consistent with the ventricular beat. It's not consistent really with the sinus beat. And this is what's called a capture beat, which means that at least for those two beats, the atrial rate was fast enough to uh, capture the ventricle in the in a repolarization, and it induces a normal QRS. So does that make sense? I don't know if somebody can text. I can explain it again if that makes sense. Um, that didn't make sense, but essentially, capture beat means that the P wave actually was able to conduct on the ventricles. The uh, uh, fusion beat is that the P wave and the QRS happen at the same time, so it's sort of like a very weird QRS that happens, and then the ventricles. Um, this is what's called uh, concordance here. This is another thing that we're looking for, and um, and uh, we can see basically that all the QRSs are negative here. So that's very suggestive that this is actually VT because it's coming from a which was very in the bottom chambers and it's uh, getting away from all the uh, peripheral beats. So that actually can also be it's not diagnostic but it's very suggestive. And then the other sign is uh, this uh, AVR here, where um, if we see a positive, uh, mainly positive deflection in AVR, that's extremely suggestive that this is VT. And um, so. This is actually something I would very strongly suggest that everybody looks for when they're unsure. Just see AVR first and see if you see a very positive uh, R wave uh, there, because that would a lot of times be able to tell you what you're looking for. Um, so these are just some examples of what we were talking about. Obviously, this is we can see the pacemaker marks here, so we know this is not ET. This is most likely a what we call pacemaker mediated tachycardia, but we've actually gotten consoles for this, and yes, I just wanted to uh, discuss this for a minute. And really, the what happens here is that the, the pacemaker is firing on its own; it's sending a retrograde impulse up the AV node, and then the atria are depolarizing, and then the pacemaker senses the atria depolarizing. So then it uh, the, the pacemaker fires again, and then it goes up the AV node, and then it senses what it's doing in the atria, and it fires again. So it sort of perpetuates that tachycardia. Um, so this is basically what we call pacemaker mediated tachycardia. And the treatment for this is that, well, first thing you just put a put a magnet on top of the pacemaker, and it'll break it. So if anybody has that is on on uh, wards and you see this, just put a magnet on top of it, and it'll. Uh, and I'll take it away what, because what happens is that when you put a magnet on it, basically the pacemaker, you turn it into a mode that's called asynchronous mode. And it basically, it stops sensing whatever needs to sense, it needs to sense. So it doesn't feel the, the atrial depolarizing anymore. So it just breaks it and just starts pacing very, very slowly at a rate of 40, 50, 60, whatever the backup rate was uh, put at the beginning. So that, that would sort of treat that. Um, The pacemaker spikes here. This is another example. Um, it would be better if somebody could uh, actually talk and uh, say what this was, but uh, this is an SVT with a variancy. And uh, the things that we can see to say that this is not uh, VT is that um, you can see that it has a normal axis. So it's positive in one, positive in ADF, and two. So we know it's like a left, like down the uh, bottom right on the our picture there for uh, what you uh, AVR is negative, and then we see that there's actually a transition of the QRSs that happens throughout the peripheral. So it's negative in V1, turns positive somewhere between V2 and V3, and then it's positive in V5, V6. So that's very suggestive that this is actually not VT and actually more likely SVT with a barency, uh, likely here with a prior left bundle branch block. So this is like some kind of SVT with a bundle. Uh, this is another one. And um, again, ideally somebody would be able to uh, try to describe it, but this is actually an example of VT. And um, the things that lead us to think that this is VT, um, first off, we see that this is a very rightward axis. So it's negative in one, negative in ABF, and negative in two. So 
So that means it's pointing on the like, top left direction. So it's a very um, rightward axis. Uh, we see that there's a positive R wave in ABR. So again, as I mentioned, this is one thing that I would really tell everybody to look at the first time they're looking on ABD and they're unsure if it's BP or ACT with the variance. But if we see a positive R wave in ABR, it's very suggestive it's BP. And then, uh, believe it or not, there's uh, small blips here, this blip here, this blip here. Those are actually P waves there. And they uh, are suggested that this is actually, this is also showing AB dissociation. And again, that's also almost diagnostic for BT. Um, so again, just to uh, press on this point, again, if anybody isn't sure if you're seeing an EKD that's BT or SVT with apparency, first thing that I would do is look at ABR. If you see a very positive deflection in ABR, initial deflection in ABR, and again, you're likely looking at something that looks that it's VT. The other thing, look at the axis, one and ABR, AVF. If you see it's very, very a rightward axis, it's likely VT because I mean, if you picture in your mind um, how depolarization should happen, it should happen from top right down the, the atria and then into the ventricles and then um, so that's why it gives us usually the positive in one and ABF, one BT or ABF in here, right? If we have it coming from the ventricle, so it'll go the complete opposite direction, it'll just go up this direction, and that's why it's like away from one and ABF, and that's why uh, BT will give us that kind of back. Um, so whenever we're encountering somebody with SVT, uh, the Q treatment, we all know this algorithm, uh, bagel maneuvers and adenosine is the first thing. Uh, Vagal maneuvers, it's something that they always talk us about, about doing, and it's a class one indication, but they're effective 28% of the time. I don't know, no. Still a class one indication to them, so we should do them, but yeah, they're not very effective. And just for uh, any kind of SVT, uh, adenosine is actually very, very uh, useful because if it's AVRT or AVNRT, it'll break it between 70 and 96% of the time. And we'll talk about why that happens, but um, the other thing about adenosine, really, if, if it doesn't break the SVT, it can also be diagnostic because you slow the AV node enough yeah, that you'll see whatever the atria is doing. And if it's flutter, you'll see flutter. If it's ATAC, you'll see ATAC. So at least it'll tell us what's going on, even, even if it doesn't break it. So it's very important that we get a, a lead, like a 12 lead at the moment that we're uh, giving the adenosine because it will help us uh, diagnose whatever's going on. Um, the next, one, the next thing, if vagal maneuvers and adenosine don't work, uh, we have to assess if the patient's hemodynamic is stable or not. If it's not, in, if it's hemodynamic and stable, and the definition for that is anybody who's hypotensive, altered, has chest pain, heart failure, or signs of shock, then obviously we need to do a synchronized heart reversion. Um, if they are hemodynamic stable, then we can try beta blockers uh, or cathode channel blockers. And interestingly enough, I feel like a lot of times we all go towards using beta blockers initially, uh, metropol five milligrams, times three, and see what happens. But uh, the guidelines actually give more importance to using verapamil or DILT uh, for these kind of patients. Uh, they tend to be more effective, in the, even though it's in the 60 to 98% range. Um, and they're especially useful for patients who recur after their dentistry. Just remember that whenever we're giving calcium blockers, we have to be sure that the patient doesn't have a history of a depressed EF, of heart failure with reduced EF, and they don't have any, and this is not BT because they're actually, they'll actually do worse than if we get beta blockers. But uh, if we're sure this is an SVT and they have a normal EF prior, then uh, we should be fine giving parapamil or DILT uh, as first line. And then, uh, yes, beta blockers are less studied than calcium blockers and apparently are less effective. Um, so ATAC, um, it's the first SVT we're gonna be talking about. And uh, it's usually related to automaticity. And basically what that means is that there's like a group of uh, myocardial cells that, that start firing on their own. So they take sort of independence of the rest of the atria and they just start firing at their own rate. Um, so one of them, what that will make it happen. So sometimes always it's gonna be difficult to differentiate from sinus tachycardia, but the main thing is that the P wave will be different from the usual sinus P wave. So, not going to come from a normal portion of the atria. Um, it's not going to be coming from the sinoatrial node, from the sinus node, but it's going to be either coming from here, from here, any other part from the atria. So what that's going to make, what that's going to, um, 
Well, an APG is basically a very a different P wave from the normal P wave. So here we can see a negative P wave on the inferior leads, which usually should be positive because it's going down and to the right. So we should be seeing a positive P wave on the inferior leads, and we see a negative P wave here. So that's actually that that would be very telling that this is actually ATAC and not uh, sinus tachycardia. The rate is usually between 100 and 250, so that's a very broad range, and um, can be irregular, especially when it warms up and it warms down. So what happens here is that, again, when we see, when we talk about automaticity, it's like a, a group of cells that, that starts firing on its own. So we are able to see when the tachycardia started. We'll see that it, it doesn't really start at a rate of 150 and just goes at 150 all the time, but rather what it does, it starts warming up. So let's say you have somebody in sinus rhythm at 80, and then suddenly they start creeping up, 110s, 120s, 130s, 140s, 150s until until it gets to that point. So it's not like it shoots up directly when we see on the telemetry. It just goes up and starts at a rate, but it rather it just goes slowly to that rate. And uh, this one will not usually terminate with adenosine. It only happens like 15, 20 percent of the time. Um, and the re main reason for that is because it doesn't use the AV node to perpetuate itself. So basically, it's, this is just a group of cells in the atria that are firing on their own, and it uses the AV node to conduct down to the ventricles. But it's not dependent on the AV node to uh, to happen. So you can slow it down for the 10 seconds that adenosine will be there in the system, but it will not terminate it most of the time. These are a couple of EKGs um, showing ATAC. Again, as we see here, we see basically what we, we could confuse as sinus tachycardia, but we again we see the P waves being negative in two. Three and AVF, so this suggests that the P wave are not necessarily coming. The impulse is not starting on the AV in the sinus node, but rather somewhere else. Um, so again, here is somebody that we should be thinking that this is actually ATAC and not sinus tachycardia. Um, this EKG, what I wanted to show is that again we talked about how patients can have two to one ATAC or three to one ATAC for that matter. Uh, it's not always flutter, even though it looks that way look that way but again we can see one p wave here and our p wave here and that's actually um, two to one ATAC. so it can also happen in something that we have to be aware of in these patients um and if you ask a good way to sort of differentiate between this being ATAC or flutter um dr nasa she has a very good way of uh, doing this and basically you we all remember the main description for uh, flutter is like a sawtooth pattern so if you're able to sort of map like sawtooth pattern yourself on the EKG and it sort of lines up exactly with the P waves that you're seeing, then it's likely flutter. If not, it's likely something else. And in this case, uh, more um, ATAC because you see the, the QRS doesn't really, the, sorry, the ST segment doesn't really change at the end of the um, QRS. So it's likely not flutter in this case. Um, usually flutter will give you like a deflection on the QRS and that's why you can sort of trace that um, um, the treatment for for this, it's very similar to any kind of uh, SVT that we saw, but in reality here, if we know somebody has ATAC for sure, at that point, we can really skip uh, giving adenosine um, because it, as we know, it won't help most of the time. Uh, and we should just go straight to using uh, calcium internal blockers or uh, beta blockers. And um, here, and they'll only be effective 30, 30 50 percent of the time, but that's even better than the 15, 20 percent of the adenosine will work. So, again, uh, the main difference, again, when we're treating ATAC is uh, adenosine will really not be helpful unless we want to try to diagnose it. But again, if we're for sure this is ATAC and the patient has a history of ATAC, we should just go straight to beta blockers or uh, beta blockers. Um, MAT. And we know it's a rapid, irregular rhythm with at least three distinct uh, morphologies of the P waves on the EKG. And uh, the best way to try to differentiate is that the, the PP, the PR, and the RR intervals will all be variable. And the main reason for that is because, well, one has to do with the AV node and how it works. But the other thing is that these are different foci in the atria firing at the same time or different times. Um, so again, this is one pulse right here, gives one type of P wave. This is an R one that gives an R type of P wave. This is an R one that gives an R type of P wave. And obviously some will be closer and some will be further away from the AV node. So that's why the PR will be different as well. And um, how long that takes will also make 
uh, unvariability on the RR and the PR and all that. So that's how that's the way you diagnose. Uh, in fact, again, we see this is a FIP here. No, we see no P, no clear P waves. A flutter. We see the typical sawtooth pattern. In MAT, we see the different types of P waves there. Um, so we all know that for MAT, the treatment is not really um, by necessarily slowing it down unless it's causing any kind of thermodynamic instability. But uh, in general, we should just try to address the uh, underlying conditions. If somebody has a COPD excavation or has a hypomagnesemia or uh, getting to the offline therapy, which are common causes for MAT, then we should treat that. Um, magnesium is actually also recommended for these patients, even if the patient is not necessarily hypokalemic, uh, hypomagnesemic, sorry, uh, it can also be useful. Um, but in general, Antirhythmics and conversion will not be helpful. So do not give these patients amio please, because it will not work for them. Um, and um, so again, in these cases, we'll just have to try to slow them down as good as, as well as we can. And uh, verapamil appears to be the best option for these patients. Even though the effectiveness is quoted at 50%, it'll be the first uh, line medication for these patients if we're trying to slow it down enough. Um, AVNRT, it's the next uh, SVT that we're going to be talking about. And uh, it's a type of reentry tachycardia, which is what we call a slow and a fast path. So I think it's like 10, 20% of the normal population has two pathways on the AV node. And one we call the slow pathway, the other one we call the fast path. Obviously, the fast pathway will always take precedence over the slow one, so we won't necessarily see it usually. Um, because obviously it's faster and it'll get to the ventricles faster. So whenever the slow path gets to the ventricles, this will be already depolarized, so we won't be able to do anything. And then the next impulse comes down the, on the atria and the fast path will take over. What happens, well, we'll start AV and RT, is a, it's usually a PAC, as we can see here, right? We just see a sinus beat, another sinus beat, and then suddenly a PAC happens. So, like everything in medicine makes sense, uh, the fast pathway will have a long, will have a longer repolarization time, so it will take longer to be able to fire again or conduct again, and the slow pathway will have will take shorter to be able to conduct. So let's say the normal beat happens, goes down the the AV node, down the fast pathway, and conducts on the ventricles, and it produces a QRS. But then a PAC happens before the fast pathway is actually able to repolarize. It. But the slow pathway will, be, will actually be uh, repolarized at that point. So it will actually be able to conduct down the slow pathway, as we see here, and produce a QRS. So if anybody ever sees how this starts, we'll see a sinus beat, sinus beat, PAC, and then we'll see a longer PR than usual. And that's because instead of conducting down this fast pathway, we'll conduct down the slow pathway and give us a, a longer PR and then the tachycardia will start. So basically what happens, it conducts on the slow pathway, produces a QRS, and it also goes up this fast pathway, and it'll just sort of perpetuate itself in a continuous circle. So in these cases, really, we'll see what we were discussing, sort of opposite of what we saw in ATAC, that it sort of warms up slowly to get to that rate. Instead of what will happen is that you'll see the PAC, and then suddenly you're at a rate of 180 consistently. So when you see the, um, the telemetry, you'll see that the, basically the rate is like sinus rate in the 80s or whatever, and then suddenly it shoots up to 180 and just starts going very, very fast at our rate. So it doesn't really warm up there, but it just gets there at, from one moment to the other one and just goes straight to that. And that's really one good way to differentiate between ATAC or AV or T if we have any doubts about that. Um, and if we want to see how it ends, usually, you know, there's just a, uh, there's a block in the conduction down the slow pathway. So we'll see like a non-conductive P wave and then it stops. Again, that could be an R way to diagnose it. And that's usually how this one terminates. And that can actually also be diagnostic for AV and RT. So these are a couple of EKGs um, of AV and RT here. Um, you can see this uh, small flip here, and that's actually a retrograde P wave, um, which is obviously what we're all just looking for because that's what we all get taught about how this happens. So it produces a QRS, goes up the fast pathway, and it gives us a P wave, and then it continues going on. Right? 
Now this is like this EKG down here in the bottom right is actually also AVMRT. And the, the thing that happens here is this is this is the opposite, uh, what we call atypical AVNRT. So as we saw here, there's a slow and a fast pathway. And usually AVNRT is a that goes down the slow and up the fast. There can be a situation where it goes down the fast and it goes up the slow. So instead of giving us a, a P wave right after the QRS, it'll take a little bit longer because it takes a little bit longer to get there and the P wave will look similar to a sinus P. So this one will actually be very complicated to differentiate for sinus tachycardia. Um, so that's when we need to look at to, uh, how it started. Um, adenosine will be diagnostic because if you give adenosine, it'll break it completely and it won't happen again. Or at least it'll stop it for a few seconds and you can see that it was truly uh, AVNRT and not sinus tachycardia. Um, so, and those kind of things can help us uh, diagnose or uh, treat this. But I, I would agree if somebody shows me this, it looks very similar to uh, AV uh, sinus tachycardia or ATAC for that matter because we have the negative P waves in uh, the inferior leads. But this is actually AVNRT, so we have to be careful about that. And, um, that's why I didn't see it might be helpful to help us diagnose what it is. Um, the treatment, again, adenosine uh, will terminate in around 95% of the cases. Um, and then again, Delta and Verapamil appear to be more effective than beta blockers. Um, but again, you have to be careful. If this is truly VT or they have a low EF. Or this is AFib with a free excitation. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, again, they are the most recommended choice, even for like chronic therapy. So you can still do beta blockers. Nobody's saying that you cannot use beta blockers, but actually calcium blockers are will be more first line than beta blockers in, in these cases. The next one, and I think this is the last one, is uh, ADRT. It's uh, atrial ventricular reinterpreticardia. And here we need to talk about a second about what's accessory pathways. Um, but it's important because AVRT actually uses the pathway, the accessory pathway to perpetuate itself, also using the AV node. Essentially here in the bottom right, what we see is uh, there's an accessory pathway here, right, in R1 here. And there's two types of AVRT. You can have orthodromic, which means that orthodromic, so it's sort of like the old way, the usual way, it just goes down the AV node and it will produce a narrow complex tachycardia. An antidromic is basically the opposite. It goes down the extra pathway and it goes up the AV node. So it will give us a white complex tachycardia because it goes down um, the pathway and it doesn't follow the normal conduction of the heart. So it will give us a white complex. Now we have to be careful with uh, accessory pathway because they can they come in basically three ways. Uh, they can either they conduct from the A to the B, from the atria to the ventricle. They can conduct only from the ventricle to the atria, which will make them uh, conceal, basically. Uh, so if you have a baseline EKG, you won't see anything. Um, but it's still there. It just doesn't conduct down the, AV, uh, the normal from the atria to the ventricle. And you can actually conduct in both directions. And uh, so we'll see it on the EKG. It does conduct in both directions. Now, this is maybe a little more advanced, but doesn't matter. But um, there is also a scenario where you can have a pathway, uh, but it's actually the, its conduction is actually slower than the AV node, so you won't see it on the baseline EKG, but it can still be there. Uh, or if it's located very, very far away from the sinus node, the sinus beep or the sinus impulse will get to the AV node faster than it gets to the pathway, and it'll conduct on the AV node, and won't it won't show you actually the delta, the typical finest of the both Parkinson's white. So, but it's still there and it could still affect us at some point. So again, the fact that it's not there doesn't mean we don't have it. It's, it's, there could be these scenarios. They're rare, but it could, there could be these scenarios. And these pathways will allow for either orthodromic or antidromic ABRT, or it can also uh, produce uh, pre-excited SVTs. And we'll talk about that in a second there. So <clears throat> just quickly, the treatment for orthodromic AVRT, because you can obviously remember that antidromic AVRT will give us a white complex uh, tachycardia, so it doesn't fall in the algorithm as to how to treat uh, necessarily the SVTs. But uh, adenosine will be effective again in 90 to 95 percent of the cases. But in this case, it's actually important to have a defibrillator 
close by. Obviously, it's always important. To, you always have to be patient with hats on and all that. But in these cases, unfortunately, what can sometimes happen is that the patient can go into AFib. And it's just, it's just something that adenosine can do. It can actually precipitate AFib in some patients. Um, so some patients can go into AFib. And if AFib finds that accessory pathway, it will lead into this what we call pre-excited AFib. And it looks horrible. Obviously, it looks like VT even. But it's just AFib that's conducting down the pathway. And uh, if a patient goes into that, that's when the treatment, and I, everybody knows, I think, this question because they always ask us on the boards. If the patient's stable, the answer is propanamide or abutilite. Amio is not a wrong answer as well, but propanamide and abutilite are actually the first line. And in these cases, this is actually when you really, really have to be concerned about using digoxin, beta blockers, or cancer blockers. Because if you block the AV node, you want to allow for the AV node to try to compete against that accessory pathway, and the patient might go into VFib because they'll go much, much faster. And then that's actually when they might uh, just precipitate VFib and the patient dies. If the patient is unstable, if this uh, pre excited AFib happens, then you do a synchronized short aversion. Um, but again, as we always get worried about what if the patient has like this pathway and do we give beta blocker still to carapamil any of that? Again, if we are not able to see pre excitation on the EKG, and again, remember that we had some um, examples as to how it can still be there without us seeing it, but if there's no pre excitation on the EKG, we can still give beta blocker still to carapamil um, safely because again, there's no harm. It, there's no risk that actually that will necessarily happen with beta blockers that will make it worse. Um, I think the last thing that I was uh, going to talk about is was uh, WPW. A lot of people, um, I guess this is more from a terminology perspective, but WPW, there's two things to discuss with it. So one is what, what we call the pattern. And when somebody has WPW pattern, it means that they just have the AKG. They have a short PR, they have a delta wave, and they have a white uterus. So again, going back here, you can see the P wave, and you can see a very short PR, which is less than 120 milliseconds, which means that the P wave, the sinus impulse, found the, the X-ray pathway faster than it usually finds the AV node, and it started conducting down the X-ray pathway faster than the AV node. It just makes the PR shorter. The ventricles start depolarizing because it goes down the X-ray pathway. And then the impulse also finds the AV node and it starts depolarizing the ventricles down the usual path. So basically what you're having here is you're having two QRSs being fused together and that's why you're seeing that white QRS and you're seeing the delta wave because the delta wave is basically the accessory pathway sort of manifesting itself. And then you see the normal QRS happening down the AV node and that's, what, that's basically what we're seeing in these cases. So anybody who has white focus or white pattern means that they just have an EKG deficit. Syndrome means that they have the EKG, and then they've actually had an episode of tachycardia uh, and palpitations associated with that EKG. Now, this tachycardia is not always ABRT, uh, as we discussed before, but it can actually also be AFib, it can be ATAC, it can be ABNRT, it can be any tachycardia that goes down the pathway, that uses the pathway. Um, and that's basically the diagnosis of uh, Wolfram White syndrome. So it can be any that you card. Doesn't need to be AVNRT. It can be actually AFib, it can be ATAC, it can be AVNRT, any of those. In these patients, I would argue that if you ever see any, any of these patients that have a, a EKG with a Wolfram White uh, pattern and they had symptoms, um, this is actually a very, very legitimate a reason to consult uh, somebody for an ablation. Because these patients, um, this is a class one indication to ablate these patients if they are amenable to, to get one. And it's very, very successful, like 93, 95% of the time, and it only has like a two to three risk of complications. So if you ever encounter a patient that came in with this and they have a delta, uh, a, like a operation white pattern in the AKG, then this is a very, very strong reason to consult EP or uh, cardiology in general to try to get an ablation. Um, and obviously this is in the case that somebody was symptomatic, okay? Um, if they are asymptomatic, so the thing changes a little bit. Um, and I, I guess the main thing really is to risk stratify them. Obviously, if they are pilots or they are uh, 
competitive athletes, will they do anything where uh, obviously passing out will not be ideal for them, or um, you you just ablated? So that's what we call like higher risk people, higher risk professions. But if they are not necessarily falling under that category, the next thing would be to just risk certify them. And uh, one way to do that would be to just put a halter on them, a halter monitor for two days or a um, couple of weeks with a new one, the SIO patch. You just see what happens. And if there's any point where they drop uh, their um, WPW pattern, for instance, here you see somebody who was uh, being put on a treadmill. So this is the or option, the GXT. You see somebody who goes a little bit faster, and then suddenly, the QRS changes completely, right? So they stop conducting down the accessory pathway. So basically that means that the accessory pathway cannot conduct past 120 beats per minute. So you would call this a low risk uh, patient and nothing is right, you need to be ablated, especially if the patient doesn't want to, because you know if the patient goes really, really fast, let's say it goes into AD and RT with a rate of 180, this pathway won't be able to conduct past the 120 beats per minute. So you're going to be safe. And the same thing you see on the culture. You see somebody who just is doing their regular activity and suddenly you saw that you see that they drop this uh, QRS morphology, and that means that it's a low risk pathway and doesn't mean it's starting to be updated. Um, but again, that sort of that's not necessarily true for pilots or competitive athletes, which are people who should be considered for an ablation. Uh, so that's, that's, those are the main um, SVTs. Um, again, as I mentioned, we're not going to Talk about paper butter. They have very different management. Um, but I don't know if anybody has any questions about those. Sure, go ahead. So that you have a question about antidromic AVRT. Do you know where I can see the code here? Maybe? Yeah, here it is. Okay. So by the by definition, it would break it because it uses the AV node to perpetuate itself. Um, so you're basically cutting one limb of the pathway. So let's say here, right? So again, the antidromic AV and RT, AV RT is where it goes down the accessory pathway and goes up the AV node. So you can see here, that it uses the accessory pathway and the AV node to perpetuate itself. If you give adenosine, it'll break this part, so it won't be able to conduct retrograde to the AV node, and it'll break the circuit because you're basically cutting one of the limbs of it. The only thing, though, is that, again, remember that it's going to give you a white compensating cardiac, so you have to be 100% sure that you're dealing with uh, AVRT, and this is not like a pre-excited AFib or something like that, because remember, as the, the faster that AFib goes, the more regular it look. Or you can look on the AKG. So if you're dealing with that and you break and you stop that, um, you can precipitate everything going down that pathway if it's really AFib with uh, uh but if you're sure this is A V R T, it should still break it. Um, the next question from Rob is uh, when somebody's having PMT and use a magnet, is there any concern about turning off the pacemaker? Yeah, so that's a good question, but I, I think if they are pacemaker depend, I guess it all depends on what you call like pacemaker dependent. If you, they won't have any kind of conduction after, and I would obviously not turn off the pacemaker. And actually turning it off, it's uh, more cumbersome than just putting a magnet. Uh, you just go, I think the CBITU and the and six half has a couple of magnets. You just go there, ask them and put it on top of it. And it doesn't turn it off, but it just turns off the uh, sensor, the sensoring of the pacemaker. So it just starts pacing on its own. At, a, at the baseline rate of like 40, 50, or 60, is what we usually put it on. Um, so it still pays for the patient. Uh, it just won't sense whatever the atrium is doing or whatever. Obviously, we don't want that permanently for the patient. We won't keep the magnet on for all for always. There's some changes on the on the pacemaker settings that we can make to to help out with this. So 
to tell the pacemaker that whatever the atrium is doing doesn't necessarily reflect a normal sinus beat, and it'll stop it. But that's further down the line, and you need the rep to help you out with all those changes. You, you could do it with if you have the machine and everything, but I would say the pay, the magnet would be your first choice. Uh, just put it on there, and it'll stop it, guaranteed. Know there's necessarily any kind of uh, like physiology to this. It, it's just basically that if you like you, you have sort of a disease uh, conduction pathway, when you go too fast, basically your um, your bundle is still not repolarized for when the next beat arrives, so it just conducts uh, abnormally. So let's say if you have a rate dependent left bundle, then your left bundle basically doesn't repolarize in time for when the next sinus beat arrives. And it basically just conducts down the right bundle and then it depolarizes uh, abnormally. So it gives you the right bundle morphology. But I don't know if there's much more to that than just that it's just sort of a disease uh, conduction system and it doesn't repolarize in time for when the next beta arrives. It's not ready to conduct again whenever the next beta arrives, and that's why it'll just conduct down one of the, the pathways instead of both. See, does anyone have any other uh, any other questions? Uh, awesome. You guys can email them to to me, and I'll I'll pass them on to Patricio if anything else pops up. Um, thanks for coming by and teaching us. That was really good, actually. That cleared up a few things in my mind. Okay, man. Um, oh yeah, if anybody has any questions, let Gino and I'll we'll be able to answer them. Thanks.